right, good morning, all you lovely people. I'm glad you guys are here. Hope you're excited to be in the house of the Lord. Would y'all stand on up and let's praise the Lord.
I love seeing that. God is so good, so great. Let's continue in worship. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. And lost without hope with no place to begin. made a way to let mercy come in when death was rested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains and my orphan heart was given a name morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was rested and my life began. my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. Amen. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. Thank you, Jesus. Well, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. displayed on a criminal's cross in darkness rejoice as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever, we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, my Death was arrested, my life began. That's when death was arrested, and my life began. 
Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love being reminded of that moment when death was arrested. Lord, you did not stay in the grave. You came bursting forth, defeating death. Thank you again so much, Lord, for giving us a new life. Oh, it's amazing, God. I just pray that this morning as we, we just continue to worship you through song and through watching baptism, God, would you encourage us, excite us, light a fire in us, Lord, to serve you more and to glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. I mean, y'all go ahead and take a seat. Well, amen. You know, freedom, freedom really is the song of the redeemed. Freedom from bondage, freedom from sin, freedom from death. Um, man, Jesus won all of that for us uh, at the cross and through his resurrection. And so, man, we are free. And, and hopefully we're growing in that freedom, growing in the understanding of, of that freedom. Hey, man, it's great to see you here uh, today, and we're always excited when we have a, a baptism because, it, you know, that just testifies and speaks to um, someone who's come into the kingdom but have experienced that freedom. And, you know, the Bible explains baptism. You know, of course, we were commanded uh, by Jesus, great commission, to go into all the world. He said, make disciples of all the nations, and then he said, baptize them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a command. And so we, we have that command, but in Romans 6, Paul kind of gives us the, the why behind the command, the meaning, and we read this often but it, because it just so well explains, I think, uh, the symbolism of baptism. We are here in this water grave, and uh, so think about these words. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, uh, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized have been baptized into uh, his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised through the dead, from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And so it's a, it's, it's a picture of the grave. We bury dead people. And so as we bury someone, and that's what baptizo means to bury, when we bury someone, uh, what they're saying is, man, I was dead. I was dead. I was dead to, uh, to the Lord. I was dead to, uh, in the trespasses of my sin and so forth. We were separated from God. We were born that way with a sin nature. I was dead, and so we bury. But then, uh, man, do you remember that moment when, the, or maybe it was days, maybe it was a while, and the Lord was convicting you, drawing you, wooing you, pulling you unto himself, convicting you of sin, and, and you said yes to him. You, you said, I believe. I believe in the cross. I believe that Jesus died in my place. He was raised from the dead. I, I believe, Lord, come into my life. Save me. Forget. Listen, at that moment, he quickens us. He makes us alive. He raises us from the dead state that we were in. But then that verse says to walk in newness of life, and that's what we call the Christian life. Um, we've been buried. We've been raised to walk and to live. Listen, we're changed. It, 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 we don't go back to the dead state that we were in, we don't go back to that. No, we, we, we have new life. We have what you just sang about, freedom. That's the song of the redeemed. <laughs> we, we walk in the freedom of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Isn't that great? All right, we, hey, we have two we're going to baptize here today. And so, Miss Ruth, won't you come first? And One more. There you go. Doing good? All right. Hey, um, last week had the joy of visiting with Scotty Birch, and this is Ruth, and, uh, and of course, Jeremy, and um, they, they just uh, desired to come and join our fellowship. So I had a joy of talking to them about the Lord and uh, hearing their story about when they gave their heart and their life to Christ. Of course, Jamie had done that a while back, Jamie Birch. And so, but uh, it's our joy to, to baptize Ruth today and, and also Jeremy. But let me ask you, Ruth, do you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Do you believe he went, left heaven, came to this earth, died on a, on a cross in your place for your sin? Have you, have you received him? Have you invited him into your life to be not just your Savior, to be, to be Lord of your life? Yes. Amen. It's 
my joy to baptize you today. In obedience to the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and because of your public profession of faith in him, it's my joy to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good? Bless you. This is, uh, this is Jeremy uh, Birch. And so, Jeremy, let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Do you believe that he died on a cross in your place to take punishment for your sin upon himself? Did that for you? I do. Have you invited him into your life to be your Savior, to be your Lord, to be your Master? I have. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and because of your public profession of faith in him, it's my joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Bless you, brother. Bless. Good morning. I hope you guys are excited to see baptism and uh, to see life change. It's only because of what Jesus did. There is no other There is no other way to be saved, no other way to get to heaven. There's no other way to have a right relationship with God but through his son, Jesus. So I love seeing baptism. It just gets me so excited. It reminds me of the day that I gave my life to the Lord, and uh, it just fills me with joy, and I I hope that does to y'all too. Reminds us that God's still working. (laughs) He's not done. (laughs) If you're still breathing, he's still working on you, and he's still working through you. So... um, I was just reading this morning in Psalms and uh, just love thinking about being in his house and worshiping him. Uh, The writer uh, in Psalm, this was David saying, a single day in your courts, Lord, is better than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than live a good life in the homes of the wicked. And so uh, just real quick, if anybody wants to be a greeter in the church, it's okay. (laughs) We'd we'd take as many applications as you want. (laughs) Uh, For the Lord is our God. He is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold you. He will withhold no good thing from you and for anyone that does what is right. Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. And so there is joy only found in him. This world doesn't have it. It really doesn't. I've spent time looking. (laughs) I can promise you it doesn't have it. God is the only source of joy, source of grace, source of truth. So thank you again, God, for what you've done. Um, As we continue to worship, let's just sing to him. And I hope you guys can sing these lyrics uh, with truth in your heart. All to Jesus I surrender. Y'all stand with us. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I surrender. surrender all all to thee my blessed 
blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to
can save. And at your name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we love you. We love singing about you. We love singing about the truth that you've given in us, the hope that you've put in our lives. Lord, I just pray that this morning as we open your word, would you draw us closer to you in the only way that you can, Lord. We know that you're the only one that can, can bring about this change in our hearts. Would you convict us and draw us closer to you and show us something new in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 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 Be seated. Man, it's, uh, it's great to see you here today. Been a good day already. Amen. Been great to be here. Um, hey, take your Bibles and be finding Philippians chapter 1. We're continuing our way through the book. We're just doing a little sermon series through the book of Philippians. And so we'll be in chapter 1 again today. Um, how many of you, in, in, at some point in your life, have felt like, man, I just feel like I'm being pulled in different directions? I feel like maybe two or three, four, maybe five different. Can I see your hand? Well, most everyone in here says, hey, I just feel like I've been pulled in different directions. That, that's what I thought of as I kind of studied this passage and read it few many many times read it through many times and I just I, that's just what came to my mind being pulled in two different directions now I will say this I also thought of that that phrase that saying when my son sent me a little video of my uh, of Ezra my grandson and let me just show you a picture of him real quick this is Ezra he is uh, four years old and uh, about to be five, really, and uh, he is playing on his first t-ball team, okay? This is the first time he's ever played, and now Marcy and I are, I mean, we're sitting here talking about it last, he's got his game coming up, and we're sitting there thinking, okay, we're going to drive two hours to watch a 45-minute game, and then we're going to drive back. So we'll drive four hours to watch a 45 minutes. Anybody been there, done that? I know, yeah, a bunch of you have. Well, hey, and I'm looking so, I'm so forward, looking for, so forward to doing that. It's going to be fun. Well, he had his first practice the other day. First practice, and his dad, my son Austin, is the coach, one of the there's several coaches, and he's the head coach. And, um, of course, if you've ever been to a t-ball game, you know the chaos. I mean, it's just chaos. It, it really is. And so when you, when you hear this phrase being pulled in different directions, well, it becomes very, very clear on a t-ball field, okay? So I've got about a 30-second video I want you to watch, and hopefully you'll get a little smile out of it as I did, okay? So let's roll it, guys. This is his first at bat in practice. Getting him all set up. He's ready. They take things so literal. Going to put exactly where he says to put his foot. All of those things. Now he's ready. Wow. <laughs> now keep watching. There you go. He made it. Well, 
Now, some, some of you would look at that, and I showed it to a few people. And you know what they said? They said, hey, man, listen, he's just, he takes his baseball skills after his Papa Jay. Hey, listen, I'll say this. I look at that, and I see a guy, I see Wes McCrotty back there, Evan Ham, some of these, Freddie Stan, some of these baseball players. I look at that, and I see a guy who's one for one with a double. That's what I see. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> he's, he's just, he's hit a double up the middle. Well, uh, you, you know, and, and uh, listen, you can get to where you're going in several different ways, amen? I mean, listen, you're going to go to Dallas. You can take a bunch of different roads to get there. He got the first, but he just took a few different ways to get there. All right, listen, I, I say that in fun, and it, it, well, it's a blessing to watch those things, but if you've ever been there, you got people run and run and go and here and go. Man, you're just, man, there's so many different directions and so much, so many commands. But as I read through this passage in Philippians 1, um, that's, that's kind of what I see. Paul's in prison. Okay, let me just give you the quick context. Paul is in prison, and he's, he's writing this letter to the Philippians. Now, he's not in prison for stealing anything. He's not in prison for killing anybody. He's not in prison for, not, uh, for cheating on his taxes or something like that. No, he is in prison for his faith in Jesus Christ and the resurrection. That and that alone is the reason he's sitting in this prison. So he's sitting in this prison. He's writing, he's writing this letter, and Paul doesn't realize, he doesn't know if today could be his last day because he knows he's facing the death penalty. He's facing execution. He ultimately does die by execution uh, from, the Roman, from the hands of the Roman government. We don't know exactly when. We know it's getting close. He wrote another letter to Timothy and so forth, but um, he knows that day is coming. So really, we could say this. As he gets up in the morning, now we can imagine this scenario, but we're not living it. He's living it. He gets up in the morning, and he doesn't know if today is going to be the day. He could very well live throughout this day. It, that could happen. But he could also, it's very, very likely that he could die today, okay? And I, I'm just, this is just Jeff talking, but I, I, I would put it out there at 50-50. Have you ever flipped a coin for something? Let's just say that Caesar, who he's going to stand before, has a coin. And he shows Paul the coin, and he says, heads and tails, heads you live. If it lands on tails, you die. And I just believe as, as Caesar flips that coin and it's going end over end over end and it's about to fall down to the, to the ground, here's what I think Paul's saying. And you, you'll see it as we read this passage. Here's what he's saying. Heads I win, tails I win. That's what he's saying. It reminds me of one of my mentors, one of my uh, heroes of the faith, Adrian Rogers. He was facing, he had colon cancer. I don't remember how, 74, 76, something like that. But anyway, it was bad. And uh, he was facing a surgery. And this came out either at the funeral or something late, days later, or weeks, months later. I'm not sure the time frame. But anyway, it came out later. Someone in the family uh, was relating this story, and then it, someone had come to him, and they were talking about this surgery. Maybe it was the surgeon. Talk, said, man, listen, this is a dicey deal. He said, man, listen, it, it could go south. It, it could go well. We, we, just, we just don't know. And so someone asked Dr. Rogers about that and said, hey, you're facing this surgery, and it's, it could really go either way. And, and he said this. These were his words. He goes, I look at this surgery as a win-win. Goes well, I win. I continue my my work and my service, my family, and so forth. And if it, if it doesn't go well, I still win because I'm, I'm bound for heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's the, uh, that's the mentality that the Apostle Paul has as he writes this. So let's look at it. Philippians chapter 1, and we'll, we'll just back up and start our reading in verse 19. He's talking about being imprisoned and so forth. He says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Because, of, listen, because of your prayers and because of the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Man, those are things that ought to happen when we're facing dire situations. Man, we, we trust in the prayers of others and, and the provision of the Lord. And he says, according to my earnest expectation, verse 20, and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness... Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, 
whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in this flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. For I do not know what to choose or which to choose. For I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that phrase, th those words there are such a challenge to my faith. What about you? I mean, here's a guy that he doesn't know which way it's going to go. It's either life or it's death, and he is perfectly fine with that. He is totally at peace with that. Nineteen times, I told you, this, this book is about joy. The title of it is Joy in the Jungle, Joy in the Difficult Things of Life. That's, what we're, that's the theme of the book. Here he is in prison facing death, and yet he has joy, and he's thinking about others' joy. The word joy is mentioned 19 times in this book. The word Jesus is mentioned 20 times. So it's, it does, listen, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. The joy is in Jesus, and that's what he has, and, and that's what he conveys. But now, here, here's, here's the question I want to ask. And as I was thinking about and reading, studying, meditating on this passage, this is the thought that, because I, as I said, it's such a challenge to my faith. What about you? I mean, can, can you sit there and say, well, this, this is exactly what I would be writing if I were facing what he's facing. Well, come on. I, I, I hope it's true, but is it? How did he get to this point where he could say, man, for, for me to live as Christ and to die, it's going to be a gain, and I'm hard-pressed. <laughs> I'm not sure which I, I really want the most. How did he get to that point? Point. Well, that's what I want us to think about for just a few moments this morning. The first thing I want us to think about, if we're, if we're going to dissect and outline this passage, the first thing is Paul's life definition, okay? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Listen, every life has a definition. Your life has a definition. And what you value, um, what you prioritize, what you do with your time, uh, how you view people, how you treat people, all and, and so many more things. But all those things will go into the definition of your life. All of those things. Someone put it this way. Your actions define your character. Your words define your wisdom. But your treatment of others defines the real you. And so every life has a definition. So what is Paul's life's defini life de definition? Well, it's only nine words. Nine words. And we see it in verse 21. Let's look at it again. For to me, now that, that's not part of the nine words, but what he's saying is this, and this is really, really important. This is the application for us. Now, here, look at me. He's saying, for to me, what he's saying is, uh, maybe a, a better translation, English translation for us would be, as for me. That's what he's saying. As for me, and what does that imply? Well, that means, hey, I'm talking about me. You're going to have to answer for you. Okay? He goes, this is, this, as for me, this is my life definition. You'll have, to, you'll have to define your own. You'll have to look at your own life and figure that out for you. You got it? So that's what he's saying. As for me, okay, look at it. For to me, here's the nine words. Here's his life definition. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul, living was not about money. He said, he doesn't say, for me to live is to get more money. For me to live is my hobby. For me to live is my sports. For me to live is my work. He doesn't even say, for me to live is my family. He says, for me to live is Christ. If I'm going to live, I'm going to live every day for him. That's what he's talking about. So let's drill a little deeper. And think about this life definition. And I would say these are the same things that should be in each one of our lives. And so I would ask you to do an evaluation and see if they are. Number one, as we drill down into his life definition, I want you to notice, first of all, his pursuit. His pursuit. 
Look at, look, turn over a page or two in your Bible to Philippians 3. And so we're just kind of, we're going to look at a few things here that really kind of make up the definition of his life, okay? Number one, his pursuit. Chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect or mature. In other words, he's saying, I haven't arrived yet. You know, some people think they've arrived. You talk to them about five minutes and you, you kind of get the idea they think they've arrived. He says, I haven't arrived yet, okay? But he said, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He's using the, the picture here of a runner who's striving and straining and, 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 and gutting it out for the finish line, okay? And so he, that's the picture. He, 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 Paul is saying, when I was saved on that Damascus road, I was put on the trail. He's like a bloodhound after a criminal. He said, man, I'm after Jesus. He goes this way, I'm going this way. He goes this way, I'm, I'm, I'm on his trail, and I'm that's the pursuit of my life. That's what I'm striving for. That's what I'm straining for. That's the language that he uses here. I would sum it up this way. Number one, he wanted to live like Jesus. That speaks of his character. Man, listen, when you say, I want to live like Jesus lived, I, want to, I, just, I just want to be like, this, that speaks to our character. Number two, not only did he want to live like Jesus, he wanted to live with Jesus. That speaks of his companion, okay? In other words, I, I want the companionship of Jesus. We sing that song, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. So that's companionship. I just want his, I want to live with, I want to get up and walk through the day with Jesus. He's the companion of my life. I want to live like him. I want to live with him, and I want to live for him. And that speaks of his conduct. Okay, so my character, my companionship, and my conduct, all of it has to do with Jesus. His pursuit, again, was not fame, not fortune, not money, not trophies, not all of this stuff. Paul was a one-way street, and that one-way street was Jesus. You understand it? All right. His pursuit, number two, his preoccupation. Now, do you ever, listen, by the way, do you ever get preoccupied now, come on, can we be honest? Listen, some of you, um, listen, you're supposed to be doing your work. Well, whatever it might be and wherever it might be, you're supposed to be doing your work, but you're getting preoccupied with fake book. Now, come on, am I getting a little close? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get a little closer to some guys. You're supposed to be listening to your wife. She's talking, and it's really, really important. It's very important. But you are preoccupied with the Razorback baseball team on television. Amen. <laughs> That's really, really close. But listen, we get preoccupied with stuff, okay? Listen, Paul's preoccupation was Jesus. L look, if you will, in chapter 12. Go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Here, here was, this was his preoccupation. He's got all these things going on in his life, and he doesn't even focus on them because he's preoccupied with this. He says in verse 12, I, in chapter 1, I want you to know, brethren, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. In other words, I'm in prison. You know, it's tough. All this stuff we can list, and all of negativity about prison, but he says, I'm, not, listen, I'm preoccupied with sharing Jesus. Every six hours, they would bring a new Roman guard in there, and they would chain him to Paul, and he had the opportunity to share the gospel. And those Roman guards, we know, uh, were the elite guards, and they would, they would go back and serve in the palace. And so every six, every six hours, who's next? Come on in here, buddy, and sit down and chain him up, and here we go, I'm going to share the gospel. Now you're going to go on back into the palace, and here's next, and come on over here. And that's the way his life was. He was absolutely preoccupied with Jesus. This, he says, this one thing I do. You know, when you think about preoccupation, I, I heard about a uh, guy who was playing the cello. Lucy, play, isn't that, is that the cello, by the way? I'm not. I, I know. A, I know what a guitar is, and I know what the drums are, but I, I'm not sure about. Anyway, a cello. And so, this guy was playing, and there were several of them, and they were an orchestra and this and that, big big outfit, and and so he's playing that thing. And uh, he's got his hands up there on the strings, I guess, in a, in a certain position. And then, man, he just starts sawing away. I mean, and it's beautiful.
But then there's some other ones, and they're doing it. And so someone comes up to him after the concert and says, whatever his name says, Sir, I noticed that um, when you're playing the cello, you, you've got your fingers fixed and this and that, and, and, and they never move. But the other people I watch, they're, they're moving around and sliding, and they're trying to, and, and, and he said, what, what, how come you do it that way and they do it that way? He said, because, here's what he said, they're continuing to look for it. I've already found it. <laughs> and that's what he's saying about Jesus. Listen, a lot of people, you're out there, I'm, I'm chasing this, I'm chasing that, I'm going here, I'm going there, and I'm preoccupied. He said, man, I found it. His name is Jesus. He is the preoccupation of my life. Number three, his pursuit, his preoccupation, his praise. Uh, Philippians 4. Turn over two or three pages now to chapter 4 and look at verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let me remind you. He's not writing this letter from a nice pastoral office or a nice crystal cathedral or anything like that. He's writing it from an old rusty Roman prison. That's where he's writing it. And yet he, he has the audacity to say rejoice in the Lord always, always. Listen, Paul, Paul's saying all of my life, every moment of my life is about the joy I have in Jesus. Paul was not a thermometer. Think about a thermometer. What does it do? It registers the conditions of the room. No, Paul was a thermostat that regulated the conditions in the room. In other words, he's not living under his circumstances. He's living over his circumstances. His life was about the joy of the Lord. His life was about praise. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 1 says this, Bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Listen, can you say it and mean it? The most important thing in your life is not what's happening around me, not even what's happening to me, most important thing is who is living in me. That's what he's saying. He said, that's how I can praise him at all times. And so I'd leave you with the timeless truth here. Praise is an excellent thermometer that registers the temperature of your Christian life. And there's a lot of truth in that. I should have put that in the, so you could write that and down. That's a good one. Praise is an excellent thermometer that registers the temperature of your Christian life. Because here's the deal. You know, um, you ever heard that old phrase, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket? Remember, a lot of these, a lot of these kids, they have no idea. I wouldn't even have an idea what that really means, my, other than that my grandfather had a well on his farm. I mean, you went down, you could look down in there, you couldn't see much of anything, but you'd throw that bucket all the way down, boom, and hit the water, psh, and then you'd pull it up. Well, listen, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket, and that's saying, that that is true of our life because it really doesn't matter the circumstances, what is happening around me, what is happening to me. Listen, in your life, what's down in the bucket is going to come up. And if it's bitterness and anger and selfishness and all that, that's what's going to come up. But man, if it's Jesus, praise and adoration and joy and worship, that's what's going to come up, no matter what's happening around me or to me. That speaks of praise. Number four, Drilling down, thinking about the definition of his life, his pursuit, his preoccupation, his praise, but now his power. Look in chapter 4 and verse 13. Great verse. We'll get to it a little later. But look at it for now. Chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, sometimes I'll... Uh, a witness to somebody, and they won't give their life to Christ, and they'll come up with an excuse, something like this. I just don't think I can do it. I, I just don't think I can live that kind of life. I just, I, I just, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I can ever do it. Listen, they have a great misunderstanding. They just say, they think the Christian life is too hard. Well, listen, let me, let me let you in on something. The Christian life is not hard. It is impossible. You can't do it. It's not the natural life. It's the supernatural life. It's, it's, listen, it's him living in me. And so, listen, I get up every day. I know good and well I can't do it. Do you? I cannot do it. I need his power. I need him living in me. So many times people think, well, the Christian life is living for Jesus. No, it's not living for Jesus. It's letting Jesus live in you. 
Now, I'm going to do something. I know it's corny, and, and so you can, you can email me and tell me it's corny, but I already know it's corny, okay? But I think it'll illustrate the point. I have a glove right here. Put it right there. And I could look at that glove, and I could tell that glove, hey, glo pick up that Bible right there. Just pick it up right now. Okay, you're not going to do that. Well, let me do something easier than that. Do you see all the wonderful, nice people out here? They're so nice. Would you wave at the nice people? Go ahead. That's simple. Anybody could do it. You can do that. Well, you and I both know it's not going to happen. But if I take my hand and I put it in this glove, guess what? I can pick up this Bible. This glove, pick up this Bible. I can wave at the nice people. Amen? But, but in reality, it's not this glove doing that, right? It is me through the glove. And that's what we need to understand about the Christian life. That was Paul's life. It's not me. It's his power in me. I can't do it. He has to do it. John 15, verse 5 says this, I am the vine, you're the branches, Jesus said. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But look, look, look. apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the Christian life. That's the power of the Christian life. Number five, not only his power, but his provision. Now, look over in chapter 4 and verse 19 for a moment. Another great verse. Chapter 4, verse 19, his provision. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's going to supply every need. He's my provision. Listen, that, that's what Paul was saying. Listen, I think Paul, as he would sit, and I think we would do this if we were sitting in that, Ro that Roman prison, we would be looking back on our life and we would be thinking, man, I've been shipwrecked. I've been within inches of losing. I've had people forsake me. I've had times when, man, I, I couldn't buy a friend. Everybody forsook me. I've been persecuted. I've been beaten. I've been imprisoned. I, and he thinks back through all the things in his life. And then he says this. As I look back on it all, God has never failed me. He's never failed me. I may not have understood everything that happened. This happened to me. That ha I, Listen, he never failed me. I want, I want to tell you something. There is not a need that you have that Christ cannot meet. Not, not one need that you have. Hey, listen, I'll take it a, ne a step further. There's not a need you can imagine you might have that he can't meet. Man, he can meet every need. And I'll say this, you know, scholars get around. I remember at seminary, we'd sit around and, uh, you know, people, people just like to talk, you know, and hypothesize, all this kind of stuff. And so they sit around at the seminary luncheon table and they'll, they'll ask a question like this. Is there anything God can't do? Rather than being out serving the Lord, doing something, they want to sit around and just talk about this stuff. Is there anything God can't do? And then they do all of this stuff. And well, listen, you can debate that if you want to stick around here and talk about Y'all go talk about that. But I'm going to say this. There's one thing God can't do. He can't fail you. He cannot fail you. He, listen, we used to sing, He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He cannot fail. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He cannot fail you. Okay, he will provide. All right. So let's 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 end this part by saying asking this. That's the definition of his life. You look at all of those things: his pursuit, his preoccupation, his praise, his his provision. All those things. That's the pursuit. That that those are the things that defined his life. I want to ask you a question: What about your life? What about your life definition? I would suggest you take this, and, and this, uh, this week, maybe you sit down and you think about that. And you, in your devotional time, you sit down and you ask maybe these five questions. Number one, what's the pursuit of my life? Well, what are you pursuing? When you get up each day, what, what are you saying? Man, you're, you're, you're chasing something. What are you chasing? Can you be honest and answer that? Number two, what's the preoccupation of your life? 
Is it fake book and social media and all that stuff and the clips and stuff? Or is that, what's, what's the, what is the preoccupation of your life? Number three, how's the praise in my life? Can, can you say it and mean it? Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> always. Not just in the good, but at all times. What's the power in my life? You trying to do it on your own? Listen, you can't live it. You cannot live it. He must do it through you. Who provides for my life? Man, listen, think about those questions, answer those questions, and you'll get your life's definition, okay? Number two. And really, this leads to, when you think about Paul's life definition, that leads to number two, which is Paul's literal dilemma, okay? Now, when I say literal, I think that's important because we would have to imagine this happening to us. We would have to imagine being in a prison, facing the death penalty, and maybe I live today, maybe I don't. We have to imagine that. He was literally facing this every day when he got up, every day. So, and, and what I want you to see, it is his definition that led to his dilemma. The way he lived his life, what his life was about is what brought on the dilemma that he faced, okay? And so, what is, what is the dilemma? Well, there's two things. There's two things pulling at him, two directions. Number one, his desire for heaven, the desire of heaven. Now, let me just say very quick, Paul's not a fatalist. He's not suicidal. He's, he's not wanting, uh, you know, just to, to end it all because he's tired. It's none of that stuff, okay? Paul, Paul knew what was waiting for him in heaven. He had seen Jesus, remember, on the Damascus Road when he was saved. He saw Jesus, but then, listen, he said these words. This kind of came to me this week. Think about these words. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. Paul's writing to Corinth, and he's saying this. Fourteen years ago, I was caught up to the third heaven. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. But I do know this. I was caught up to paradise. And I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Another place, he says, man, eye is not seen, ears not heard, nor can we even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. He said, man, I've been there. I'm not sure if I was in my body or not. I don't know, but I was overwhelmed by what I saw and what I heard. I can't, I can't, even, I can't even share it. And so he he's, he's has a desire for that because he's seen that. So let me, let me just put it this way. This, this dawned on me this week. And I don't know exactly, but think about his early perspective. I'm talking about Paul's perspective on life. Think about his early perspective, and I think what was his early perspective most likely is our perspective in this room, a lot of us today, okay? Here, here's the early perspective. I am willing to die, but I'm wanting to live, okay? Am I, am I, am I shooting it straight? I, I'm willing. I'm saved. Absent from the body, present. Well, I know that I'm going to be with you. I know all that. Listen, I'm, I, I'm willing to die, but I'm wanting to live, okay? Now, as Paul writes this, his current perspective is, I'm willing to live, but I'm wanting to die. Do you see it? That's what he's saying. So again, I mean, how do we get to that point? How do we have that kind of faith? How do we live that kind of life? Well, I think it goes back to our life definition. He, he said, man, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to live. I, if, I, if, I'm, if God wants me to stay, I'll stay here. I, I, I get it. I'll, I'll do it. But, man, listen, I'll tell you what I want to Because what does he say? Verse 21. He says, to live is Christ, but to die is a gain. He says, man, well, how, how can he say that? Because he had been there. He saw Jesus on the Damascus Road. He had caught up to the paradise. He saw it, and he says, I'm telling you, to die is a gain. Now, sometimes we lose sight of that. Amen? And, and, and I think it was Adrian, who, uh, Dr. Rogers, who used to say, man, we pray harder to keep the saints out of heaven than we do the sinners out of hell. Because we don't have that perspective. I'm willing to live, but I'm wanting to die. That's what, that was the dilemma that he faced, okay? So, number one, the desire for heaven. But now, number two, pulling in a different direction is a duty to help. On, this, on the one hand, I, there's this desire to go be with the Lord. That's much better. But then on the other hand, there's this desire to help the Philippian church. 
Because look, look at what he says in verse 24. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Uh, you know, he just says, man, I just, I just don't know. This, I, I, I want to go to heaven, but I, I, I need, there's so much to do here and serve the church and so on and so forth. And hey, believe it or not, what we want in life is not the main thing. Did you know that? Come on, can we, can we humble ourselves to say, hey, and come to, to realize, hey, what I want is not the most important thing. What you want is not the most important. What's the most important thing? Well, what does God want? What does he want from me and of me? That's the most important thing. Paul was a guy, listen, who lived for others. Now, the Bible says, and this is tough, this is hard, and, you know, we come in here, and we, 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 oh, how I love Jesus, and uh, we do all of this stuff. But I'm telling you, here's when the rubber hits the road when it comes to our dealing with other people. Been a pastor 35 plus years now, and I've seen it. But I'm telling you, Paul was a guy who loved others. This is an amazing verse when you really think about it. A bit on the screen, Romans 9, verse 1. <laughs> He says, it's Christ, and he goes, in other words, what I'm about to tell you is you're not going to believe it. You're just not going to believe it. So he prefaces it by saying this. Christ is my witness. I'm speaking with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit are going to confirm it. In other words, you're not going to believe it. But I'm telling you, Christ is going to confirm it. The Holy Spirit's going to confirm it. My conscience is clear. I, what I'm about to tell you is it's amazing. But I want you to hear it. Here's what he says. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing, now look at this, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Jesus Christ, if that would save them. Man, again, what a challenge to my faith. He, he's so thinking about others. Man, listen, do we not live in a world that so thinks about me? Well, what about me? And you've offended me, and I'm offended, and this and that. And it's all about me. He said, man, I'm willing to be cursed, cut off, sent to hell. Man, if it would save my Jewish brethren. I'm telling you, that's a guy who's putting others in front of himself. You know, as I think about Paul, he... He's about to finish the race. That's, what, that's the language he used with, with Timothy. I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish the race. And, and I, I think he, he knew if he lived, in other words, you know, you think about this, I got this, uh, this desire for heaven, but this duty to help. And if I stay here and help, listen, most likely it's going to be more imprisonment, more beatings, uh, more, more desertion, people forsaking me and, all, all this stuff, more prisons. And I think he could have said, you know what? I'm just, I think I've about had enough of it. I, I just think I've about had enough. I, I'm ready to go and be with the Lord. But then he thought, what about others? You know, there's that acrostic. This whole book's about joy. And so let me just throw it out to you very, very quickly. The word joy, J-O-Y. Paul's life was Jesus first. We said it a minute ago. It was, that's his passion. That was his pursuit. Jesus and then others and then yourself. That's joy. Listen, would you say amen to that? Yeah. We say amen to that. But the question would be, do we live that? What, what does Y-J-O spell? What does Y-O-J spell? Because I think for mo most people, it's yourself first. But he says joy is Jesus, others, and myself. The last thing, Paul's definition, his dilemma, and now his determination, his loving determination. So he said, I'm being pulled in different directions, and here's the conclusion he comes to. Look in verse 22. He says, if I'm to live on in the flesh, it's going to be fruitful labor for me. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. For me to live as Christ, if I live, I'm going to be bearing some fruit for the Lord. Look in verse 25. He said, convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith. And so that, you know, your, your proud confidence in, may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to see you again. He said, I just believe I'll probably see you again. We don't know if he did or he didn't. But he, he's saying the, the determination he'd kind of come to is, okay, 
God still has some work for me to do. Hey, can I tell you one thing, by the way? I, 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 you know, how many truthful things do I know this morning? Well, I, I sit down and think of it. I could probably mention a bunch of them. But let me say one truthful thing I know about you, about you and you and you and everyone in this room. One truthful thing I can say. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here it is. God has work for you to do. He has fruitful labor, labor for you to be involved in. He does. You know, we get this thing sometimes that we just retire. Listen, I understand you may retire from your secular job, but we never retire from our spiritual job. Never. You say, well, I'm, I'm getting older. I understand. I am too. But I'm telling you this. I don't care what your age is, there's a job for you to do. I don't care what, did you hear me? I don't care what your age is. There's a job for you to do. So forget this nonsense, well, I've put in my time and I've done this and I've done that. Listen, I don't care what your age, there's still work for you to do. There's still labor for you to do. There's still fruit for you to bear for the Lord. Have you, verse 22 talks about fruitful labor. Let me ask you this. Are you bearing fruit? I'm talking about for the Lord. You say, well, I got a raise last year. I'm not talking about that. I'm asking you, are you bearing fruit for the Lord? Is there fruitful labor in you? Do you know why so many Christians are unhappy? Do you ever, do you ever meet an unhappy Christian? Man, I meet them all the time. Do you know why Christians are unhappy? Do you know why certain Christians are, are so critical of others? Listen, some Christians walk in, listen, they walk in here. They'll walk in this room. They'll sit down in one of these pews, and, and they, they gripe. They're gripers. They say, well, why are they doing that way? Well, why are we doing this? And why didn't we do it that way? And I think it'd be better to do that. And, and, they, and they, they, they're critical. They're gripers. They're unhappy. There's even some bitterness. And, and listen, can I tell you why? Can I, be, I just want to be transparent. Can I tell you why? Do you want to know why they're that way? You want to know why you're, some of you are not, they're that way? Because they don't do one single solitary thing for the Lord. They do nothing for God. Nothing. Well, I came in here and I sat down and I listened to you for 45 minutes. If you want to call that your fruitful labor, good luck with that. That's why there's someone you don't, you don't, don't do anything. Charles Spurgeon, when he was saved, he began to distribute tracts all over London. I mean, he went door to door, house to house, uh, street to street, doing all this stuff. Someone saw him doing all of that and continued going on and on and on and said to him, said, Spurgeon, ever since you've been saved, you're just restless. You're just restless. You're just always doing something. Spurgeon's response was, I cannot be happy unless I'm doing something for God. I've got to do something. I pray that would be you. Would you stand with me for a moment? Go ahead and put your Bibles down and stand very reverently. and Because I, 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 I want you to look at me. I want you to think about this. We're going to finish this message here, okay? And here's how I want to do it. I want to go back to verse 21. His life definition was for me to live as Christ. As for me. Listen, you're going to have to decide for you. You have to decide for you. Paul says, as for me, if I'm going to live, I'm going to live for Christ. If I die, it's a gain. So here's the question. I want to put it on the screen. I want you to look at this, and here's what I want you to pray and ask the Lord very seriously, honestly, right now. For me to live is what? What, 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 are, you, what are you living for? What are, I mean, you get up and you breathe God's fresh air. You enjoy his provisions. What, what, what are you living for? Can I help you? If you put in there, for me to live is money, you go back and you look at verse 21. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is a gain. So anything else is a loss. You put in there, for me to live is money, I don't care how much you get. It was a Rockefeller who said, man, how much you need? I just need a little bit more. If you say, for me to live is money, to die is going to be a loss. If you say, for me to live is my family, as wonderful as that, to die is going to be a loss. For me to live is 
sports. For me to live is happiness. For me to live is my hobbies, hunting, fish. And that, for me to live is, if you fill in the blank. I'm just telling you, if it's anything other than Christ, it's a loss. Amen? That's what he's saying. Would you bow your heads for a moment? And let's just do business with the Lord before we leave. services are coming to a close here at First Baptist Dover, we are currently extending an invitation to people in our sanctuary to trust Christ. I'd like to extend an invitation to you as well. If you've never trusted Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, I would strongly encourage you to do that. We want to help you in that decision. The Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you will sincerely turn from your sins and invite Jesus to come into your life, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord, the Bible promises that he will do exactly that. If we can help you in any way we want to do so, uh, our contact information will be at the end of this video. May the Lord bless you, and I hope you'll join us again very soon, either in person or by way of our live stream. God bless you.